Hi, friends. It's Lauren Hunter with HSP Journey. I have with me today our beloved guest writer, Lori Cangilla. Lori, thank you for being with us again today. Thanks so much, Lauren. I'm so happy to be here. Lori is a highly sensitive person. She also uh, runs a, a vibrant practice um, where she is a psychologist and coach and therapist with uh, lots of sensitive people and sensitive people that struggle with things like performance anxiety and imposter syndrome. Um, tell us a little bit about your clients, uh, of course, keeping everything um, anonymous, but where do you see a thread for HSPs um, with this concept of performing or speaking, or I'm a musician kind of as a hobbyist musician. And um, when you write about these things, it really touches me. And I, I see myself um, in a lot of the things that you describe. So what you brought this idea to me, what, what do you see out there? Yeah, I, well, partly I see this in myself too, you know, as, as a writer, as a public speaker, there is a lot of opportunity to feel that performance anxiety and imposter syndrome. And I think for highly sensitive people, because we are so in tune with what happens in our bodies and what happens with our emotions, it's really easy to be paying a lot of attention to what it's like when we're in situations where we're performing in some way. And that, that could be as a musician, as a writer, as a speaker, it could be, you know, someone who's training for an athletic event or someone who is baking a cake for a big family gathering. You know, it doesn't have to be the kinds of things that we necessarily think of just as performing arts um, or even just workplace performance. But I think for highly sensitive people, there's such a tendency to notice the ways that we feel uncomfortable, uncertain, and we're really sensitive to the, the feedback that we get from the environment. So if I'm giving a talk and I see somebody in the audience and they kind of make a face, you know, my highly sensitive nervous system is going to race to, oh, they didn't like what I said, or I'm losing them. And, you know, maybe they're just uncomfortable or their phone rang or, you know, it might not have anything to do with right. what I'm doing. Right. But as sensitive people, we notice that in a way that many non-highly sensitive people might could be completely oblivious of what's going on. So it's, it's that one-two punch of being like very perceptive about things and then having a really big heart and taking it a lot, uh, taking a lot of things to heart um, when we're in those situations where we're putting a part of ourselves out into the world. Yeah, totally. Um, one thing came to me, I was thinking of a speaking event that I did, um, and there were 400 women, um, and it was a little bit dark, uh, and I could see the people close, close to me and I could read their reactions and it really helped me in a positive way. It was a very short talk at a women's breakfast. Um, and it really buoyed me, um, to like thrive off of their emotion to like bring it home. And I, I had, um, I, I haven't given a ton of of, of talks and speaking, but I do have like a long career in public relations and it plays into this article that we're talking about today with imposter syndrome. When I was right out of college, I worked for a tech PR firm and I kind of got thrown to the wolves. So I had to MC events, um, that were like Silicon Valley, important people. And I was 21, uh, sorry, 22. I had just turned 22. Um, and so I just remember that feeling of like, who am I? Like, I know nothing, but I'm going to fake it. I'm going to fake it till I make it. Um, so it's important, I think, to, to recognize like what season you're in, um, because that looks very different, maybe with more experience under your belt, maybe imposter syndrome isn't something, you know, you think about on a daily basis, but then you pivot into a new path in your career and it like rears its ugly head, uh, <laughs> or you're yeah, asked to speak to like a super, um, like this women's event I did, I'd never given a talk to that many people. So, um, I had a sense of like pride about it and that they asked me to do this and I played a song to go with it. Um, but I really had to fight. I had to listen. Um, and I had to like recognize the, the, the evil voices that kind of, <laughs> who are you? You can't do this. You know, you know, this little chirpy, like the the good angel and the bad angel, like warring against each other. Yeah. So, so tell us um, in this article about um, predisposition to imposter syndrome for sensitive people, what are a few of the factors? 
Yeah. So I think like part of the factor is that that way that we think about things really deeply and our brains are really active and it's almost like that bad angel that has all the, the negative chirping about who am I to do this and I can't, and they're going to figure out that I wasn't qualified. That voice is so loud and it's very hard to silence. So that, that need to kind of deal with the part of our, our, our wiring that just thinks a lot about everything is really important. Yeah. Have you ever heard or read, um, I think Brené Brown uh, has talked about this in a talk, but it's also in one of her books and I forget which one, but she talks about the story we tell ourselves. That's her language. And that little nugget uh, has helped me a lot because sometimes we go down the rabbit trail thinking that we are you know, super empathetic and we um, are intuiting um, what someone else is thinking or feeling and we're wrong. Have you been wrong? Oh yeah, I think we've all <laughs> been wrong, right? And I, like I think to say that HSPs are never wrong, but it's not true. <laughs> no, it's not true. And I, I actually think that takes some of the pressure off knowing that we can be wrong or at the very least it off, opens up that possibility where we can consider, well, maybe there's another possibility. Maybe this story that I'm telling myself about not being good enough and people are gonna figure out that I was never qualified and they should have never given me this assignment. If, if there's a possibility that we're wrong, then we can start to, to tweak away at that and start to change that story. Right, right. So so what would some tips be? Um, say I'm, I'm one of your clients and I'm coming to you. I have a big event coming up and I'm sort of freaked out about um, feeling like I'm not equipped to, to do that. What are some of the techniques or um, modalities that you use? So the first thing I really encourage people to do is to acknowledge what they're feeling and they're thinking. So if you've ever been, let's say, anxious about something in general, and someone tells you, just relax, calm down, you know, can you calm down? I get like ragey almost when people tell me. Yeah, like, that, don't, that doesn't don't work. That I have to have something to do. Yeah. 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 So the first thing is to acknowledge that, like, I'm feeling these things that are imposter syndrome and just acknowledge it as a factual way. Like that feels really true to me right now. It feels really hard to let go of that thought. And then I think when we do that, we create just enough space in our emotions to be able to say, can I see this from a different perspective? Mm. And I encourage people to do a lot of work with acceptance and really just acknowledging, I feel this way and I'm going to go ahead and do this event anyway. I feel like I'm not going to be ready for it. And I'm going to keep doing the things I need to do to get ready so that you're teaching your, your nervous system and you're teaching yourself this idea of, I can feel this imposter syndrome and I can allow it to be there and I don't have to argue it or attack it directly, but I also don't just collapse and give up and not do anything. I continue to take action in the way that I need to. And usually when people can get some momentum in that process, it helps to automatically shift that story we tell ourselves. Hmm. You know, we start to tell a story of like, yeah, I was having a lot of imposter syndrome, but I really did my best to do all of these things to get ready. And I I talked with a friend who gave me a pep talk and I spoke to my mentor about how to do this well. And here I am doing it or I did it. And it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Right. I love how you bring in talking to a mentor or talking to a friend. I, um, I call, I, I have a wellness team. Like I think of my therapist, my, I have a wellness coach, um, that I get through my medical insurance, which is wonderful. Um, and, uh, I have a chiropractor I go to, I have a medical doctor, I have a husband who's attentive. I have several good friends who I can go to, to talk through things. And so I think of those, that robust team, if you don't have a team and you're sensitive, <laughs> think about, um, creating, and it could be, you know, you're in, um, a coaching group, um, or a therapy group or support group, and that can help as well. But, um, airing out airing things out, like, um, that really helps and goes with that acknowledgement. I feel like when it's not, um, you know, something awful that you have to, it, 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 every chances are other people are experiencing this similar things as you. And so when you go, Hey, I'm kind of struggling with this, you know, and maybe the person is like, Oh, I've never struggled with that before. That's okay. If you, if you're talking to the right person, they will support you and they will say, Oh, wow, I haven't experienced that, but tell me about it. Um, and then kind of going through that walking, even journaling, um, 
I'm doing an inner child program right now, talking to your inner child that can really help. And you connect with that little girl, little boy inside of you. And it's probably, you know, they're probably scared. Um, and so kind of unifying that what happened in the past and what happened in the future, maybe, maybe you're asked to speak in elementary school and you had a terrible event and you froze up and here you are 30 years later with a speaking opportunity. And that, that fifth grade event is still in your mind. Um, yeah. and I think you're, I think you're so right. So much of imposter sh syndrome has those, sh those almost shameful feelings of like, mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like I'm good enough or worthy or, you know, people are going to think badly of me. And that just festers in the dark. That's part of why we have to start to acknowledge it to ourselves. And, and I love that idea of, of thinking about it as who's your wellness team, mm -hmm. who are the people who are your champions, who are really going to help you air that out and look at it and figure out what you can do to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, the full article will be linked below this video, and we're going to offer just a lot more detail and information that Lori has written about imposter syndrome. And she also runs a fabulous blog over at singularlysensitive.com. And this is an area of her specialty. So if you need some assistance with this particular issue, please feel free to reach out to Lori directly. And just thank you so much for lending your expertise to my audience. I appreciate that. We appreciate that. And we look forward to our next conversation.